of old time songs was a presentation on your dial of 1250 kilocycles. WHBI, Hoyt Brothers Incorporated, Newark, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, we present at this time the regular Sunday afternoon address to Father Charles E. Coghlan from Royal Oak, Michigan. and gentlemen, as usual, Father Coughlin will bring you his regular Sunday afternoon address. In the first part of his address, he will comment upon President Roosevelt's message to Congress. The second part will be concerned with the Christian family. Now that Congress is in session, now that the entire nation is interested more than ever in the presidential elections, may we invite you to read Social Justice Magazine the profits from which publication are devoted in their entirety to help keep Father Coughlin on the air. As you know, these broadcasts are paid for at full commercial rates. They are in no sense a donation by any of the stations which carry them. Consequently, any contribution that you care to make to maintain Father Coughlin on the air throughout the entire year, a year when the principles of social justice of Americanism and Christianity are being weighed in the balance, any contribution that you care to make will be most welcome. Those of you in this audience who desire a copy of today's address, simply direct your letter to Father Coughlin at Royal Oak, Michigan, and he will mail you a printed copy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Father Coughlin. Ladies and gentlemen and friends, in his latest message to Congress on the State of the Union, President Roosevelt focused public attention upon many vital truths. Tempering his hitherto generic condemnation of foreign dictatorships, he ventured to specify the cause for their appearance in nations that formerly leaned to a democratic type of government. He said almost at the outset of his carefully couched speech, quotations, the social and economic forces which have been mismanaged abroad until they have resulted in revolution, dictatorship and war, are the same as those which we here are struggling to adjust peacefully at home. You are well aware, continues the president, that dictatorships and the philosophy of force which justifies and accompanies dictatorships have originated in almost every case in the necessity for drastic action to improve internal conditions where democratic action, for one reason or another, has failed to respond to modern needs and modern demands, unquote. Might these unambiguous words permit us to conclude that the continued mismanagement of domestic affairs in the United States will produce results in our homeland similar to those which have appeared abroad? During our lifetime, Italy elected to follow the pattern of fascism. The Kerensky democracy of Russia melted into the crimson regime of Lenin and Stalin. Hindenburg's government degenerated into, into Hitler's monopolization of political power. Portugal and Spain abandoned social democracy. Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland ceased to function 
under a duly elected representative government. So did England and France since the outbreak of the war. Now, in each and other instances, financial and economic necessity required drastic action to improve internal conditions when democratic action, for one reason or another, failed to respond to modern needs and modern demands, President Roosevelt's words. It is regrettable that, having evolved political liberty through the many sacrifices of the past several hundred years, all these nations found it compatible to surrender this benediction to secure bread, clothing, and shelter, the bare necessaries of life. Probably then, this is the opportune time to express a few pertinent thoughts on the subject of democracy. The democracy that failed in foreign lands. To the end that we who are devoted to its doctrine of liberty and of representative government may take counsel with ourselves how to preserve it in America. Correctly speaking, Ours is a republican form of government composed of three separate independent branches. We Americans are privileged by a majority vote to elect representatives of the people to an independent Congress whose function it is to make laws in harmony with an established constitution. The constitution which also recognizes an independent executive branch of government, does not permit the executive either to make laws or to interpret them as he pleases. It limits him, together with his secretaries and assistants, to execute only those laws passed by Congress and in the case of a substantial dispute as to the constitutionality of the laws, it obliges him to abandon them either entirely or in part when the Supreme Court, the third independent branch of government, issues a decision. The United States of America, my friends, is neither a dictatorship nor a democracy in the full sense of the word. At most, it is a limited democracy, which I again designate as a republican form of government. Now observe that each of the three independent branches of government, although cooperating with the other two, is limited by specific powers and prerogatives that the people themselves are limited by the Constitution insofar as a mere majority cannot alter that basic document. And finally, that the content of the Constitution is limited, roundly speaking, to the will and decision of two-thirds, not one-half, of the people. In its constituted form, our democracy depends for its operations directly upon representatives and indirectly upon the people. We are subject in our choice of representatives to our common understanding and appreciation of the questions of the day, to the policies proposed, and to the agencies such as the press and the radio and the platform which expound them, and thereby influence our thoughts and habits. Thus, in its final analysis, our government is no better than the people themselves, despite the Constitution, which is its political bedrock. If, therefore, as Mr. Roosevelt remarked, dictatorships have originated abroad in almost every case, 
through the necessity for drastic action to improve internal conditions where democratic action failed, it is possibly true that the retention of democracy would have proved to be a greater menace than the adoption of dictatorship because both the people abroad who are privileged to vote and the representatives whom they elected were no longer capable of achieving the objectives of peace, prosperity, and national happiness. In his essay on modern democracy, the eminent scholar Lord Bryce has this to say, quotation, in the form which it has almost everywhere taken, that of government by a representative assembly, democracy shows signs of decay. For the reputation and moral authority of elected legislatures have been declining in almost every country. In some, they are deemed to have shown themselves unequal to their tasks. In others, to have yielded to temptations. In others, to be too subservient to party. While in all, they have lost some part of the respect and social deference formerly accorded to them. According to this same scholar's version, incompetent representatives and crass politicians undermine the foundations of democracy. They were leaders who were no better than the people themselves. And speaking about this leadership, Lord Bryce adds, quotations, it is clear that nowhere does enough of that which is best in the character and talent of the nation find its way into these assemblies. In this respect, the anticipations of 80 years ago have not been realized. Now, while we do not quarrel with Lord Bryce's observations, may we add the following thoughts. The political problems of leadership and democracy are inextricably tied up with the deeper and more complex problems of intellectuality and spirituality. An uninformed populace will elect an uninformed rabble-rousing Congress. A godless people under a democratic constitution will elect godless representatives. A materialistic-minded people will choose a materialistic-minded leader. A democratic nation gets the kind of government that it deserves. It becomes the beneficiary or victim of its own virtues or vices. Under a democracy, then, there is that constant and prevalent danger when religion is divorced from our social activities that everything noble, supernatural, and exceptional will be dragged down to the gutter of mediocrity. As pernicious as is the dictatorship of a Stalin, is the dictatorship of a carnal-minded, uninformed, and propagandized majority, no matter how well it is physically organized, either in the ranks of labor or in the halls of Congress. Now, we Americans are mightily concerned with saving our American democracy that has failed so long to function advantageously for the nation, that has counted its unemployed by the millions, that has multiplied and still plans to multiply taxation, that has created and still creates class animosity. How shall we proceed? First, we must save our individual selves. 
holding fast to the traditions that formerly made us great, and recapturing those which we have surrendered to politicians who have made us weak. Consequently, while every effort must be made to preserve our constituted form of government so that it will function for the common temporal and spiritual welfare of all, let us not be so childish as to accept the fallacy that democracy of itself will be our salvation. Democracy will not save us we will save democracy. Under God, a virtuous people and not their form of government is the key which unlocks the treasure room where liberty, prosperity, peace, and happiness abide. The history of the birth and decay of democracy should supply us the lovers of freedom, with a plenitude of food for thought. These years taught us how unsubstantial was the dream of the French revolutionists who preached their materialistic liberty, equality, and fraternity. It was a dream dissipated by the death-dealing cannons on the battlefields of Belgium and France. The disciples of Rousseau, Kosciusko, Franklin, Byron, Mazzini, and Bajornson, all religious indifferentists, who preach the doctrines of social democracy, were routed. Where was their boasted flag of liberty? All oh, find it unfurled in the mud-strewn acres of France, plotted in the hovels of poverty, paraded in the vanguard of the hungry unemployed. And what equality did they achieve? Equality with our rats and vermin in the corpse-laden trenches of death. And what of their fraternity? It was the same kind of fraternity enjoyed by the galley slaves of old. A fraternity of debt. A fraternity of indigence. A fraternity that forced entire populations to bow before the god of gold. For a moment, forget politics and economics. Face with me the stark realistic causes of democracy's failure abroad. Causes which we in America must avoid. The liberalism and the irrational tolerance of the 19th century persisted in undermining the religious foundation and the high ideals which originally inspired the democratic revolutions. Yes, and which originally inspired man's quest for freedom. In the 19th century, man's omnipotence was preferred to God's. Intellectual confusion was accepted instead of faith. From the highest to the lowest, conscience was traded for profit, and spiritual values were esteemed as impediments in the path of material progress. These, my friends, were the basic causes which produced a civilization where the one-time compelling force of moral values surrender to economic and political domination. Liberty was bound to degenerate into anarchy. Equality and fraternity were destined to dissolve into dictatorship. At first, the dictatorship of economic and financial imperialists. Then, that of a Lenin who at one fell swoop crystallized the godlessness of his age into the doctrines of Bolshevism. And later on, into the dictatorship of a Hitler who amalgamated the errors of political partyism 
and state supremacy into his national socialism. Oh, a godly people instructed by a virtuous pulpit, informed by an honest, fearless press, and schooled in institutions which in the name of tolerance did not ostracize the divinity from the curriculum, that kind of people will be blessed with godly leaders. But if the contrary exists, democracy becomes a tyranny, productive of the excesses which mark the course of the past century and which promises to bear no better fruit for those who still persist in entrusting their destinies to political partisans who play down to the passions, the prejudices, the ignorance, and the unnecessary sufferings of the classes and masses instead of up to God, the same type who were responsible 1900 years ago for arousing the cry of crucify him, give us Barabbas. While our chief executive discussed foreign affairs in a general manner, he asserted that we should concern ourselves with nations abroad. In these days when the accidents of space and time have been curtailed by the airplane and the radio, this world of ours together with all its nations and peoples has become a rather narrow habitation. Most certainly, we are neither indifferent to what transpires abroad, nor are we unaffected by foreign affairs, by foreign ideology. But that word, abroad, it not only connotes the small territories of England and France, comprising less than 150 million population. Oh, it connotes for us the existence, for example, of more than one billion persons resident in the Orient, creatures of the same God whom we worship sharing in the pricelessness of the same blood of Calvary which redeemed us. To them, as to us, are applied the words of divine scripture, namely, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If therefore in some political quarters there has arisen again the fear of the yellow peril, now that India, China, Japan, and Russia are in social ferment, let us recollect that the real yellow peril is not one of race, but one of gold. I refer to our ill-advised attempt through the existence of a tripartite financial agreement between ourselves and France and England to impose our economy our gold standard tradings upon the major part of a world that has no gold, to an attempt, if you please, to restrict the meaning of that word abroad, to an attempt, if you please, to hold Asia in economic subjugation as if Asiatics were not destined to participate in the goods of creation. At home, we have a plenitude of problems, as our president indicated. While our factory production may equal that of 1929, our taxation and our unemployment problems are of grave concern. For seven consecutive years, we've grown accustomed to the promises of less and less spending of borrowed money. For seven years, we have waited patiently to see the money changers, the coin clippers, driven from the temple. 
For seven years we have hoped to witness the sunrise of economic liberty without which political liberty is a mockery. Therefore, we congratulate our president for having said, quotations, for many years after the World War, blind economic selfishness in most countries, including our own, resulted in a destructive minefield of trade restrictions which blocked the channels of commerce amongst nations. This policy was one of the contributing causes of existing wars. It dammed up vast unsaleable surpluses, helping to bring about unemployment and suffering in the United States and everywhere else." Unquote. May Mr. Roosevelt plan to reduce the implications contained in these words to practice. From a mundane point of view, the wars of the past century were motivated by economic causes, namely the desire on the part of nations to possess raw materials, colonies for expansion, the desire on the others to impose trade restrictions and to seek world domination, and then the inevitable clash of arms. Thus, if new trade agreements will be considered in this coming Congress, let them not be entered into either to maintain the gold trading standard, which has menaced the world's peace, or to break down the standard of American living for the benefit and profit of a few. Else, else the hollow shell of democracy will crack. Again, we congratulate His Excellency on that portion of his message to Congress in which he reminded us of the admonition enunciated by George Washington relative to entangling foreign alliances. Although we vividly remember the attempts on the part of this administration to involve us in the world court, although we presently smart economically as a result of the financial agreements entered with Britain and France by this government, it is to be hoped that his implied pledge to abide by the courts originally chartered by George Washington will be remarkable in years to come by its fulfillment. We are not rabid isolationists, yet we are Americans conscious of the fact that our ancestors fled Europe with its religious bigotry, its perennial poverty, and its old age wars to establish the foundations of a new nation from which these aberrations would be absent. My friends, in these days when we are witnessing the decay of democracy, which word in our American vocabulary is related to political liberty, may I reiterate how necessary it is for the people of this nation to recognize that no liberty which our ancestors won in the past is retainable unless there is a definite acceptance of the Christian truths without which freedom is impossible. Let not our spirit of democracy which respects the rights of minorities impel us to disrespect the rights of Almighty God, who is the most potent, the most necessary, the most vital minority in our complex civilization. Without him, we can accomplish nothing. With him, all things are possible. Although we have grown accustomed to weigh presidential messages to Congress, in the same scales in which we appraise party platforms and political promises, it is to be hoped 
that we who are struggling almost alone to save the last vestiges of limited democracy will resolve to place patriotism above partyism, Christian morals above pagan economics, and religious principles about political expediency to the end that we will let shine the lamp of Christ's truth to a world that has been stumbling in the rocky ravines of darkness. Time alone will tell. The advertised pronouncements of men will vanish like the morning mist. Their deeds, their deeds alone will live after them. And by these deeds, future generations, yea, their own contemporaries, will appraise them. Tomorrow is the anniversary of Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States. American tradition long since has revered him as one of our greatest Democrats. And the Democratic Party of which Mr. Roosevelt is the chieftain, long since has claimed him as one of its outstanding apostles. To honor this indomitable leader, a multitude of dinners is scheduled for tomorrow evening, at which will attend the followers of the Democratic Party. Now, 